ever find yourself searching for something bigger than you? For a community to be a part of? A place founded on truth and love. A place to worship the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, and the Son of God. Welcome to Founded in Truth, where we're more than just a fellowship. We're a family, so welcome home. All right, so as you all know, we are approaching Thanksgiving, which is a very, very important holiday. It's a very important holiday. And it's not a holiday that we're told to celebrate in the Bible, obviously, it's an American holiday. But it nevertheless carries an important biblical theme, therefore it's an important holiday, I think. And that theme is gratitude or thankfulness, being thankful. This is something that I believe is fundamental for us as believers. It's fundamental. It's not just something that we can add to our lives. It's not just something that we can do without or or do with it. No, it is foundational to us. Now, a lot of people, when they talk about this topic. They, they kind of approach it from the perspective that as long as you have a positive attitude, life is going to be easier and you're going to be more successful. Well, I'm not really here to talk about that today. Uh, my, my focus in presenting this topic of gratitude is not to make sure you're happy and successful, and not that I want you to be unhappy or unsuccessful. I'm just saying that my primary concern as a teacher is this. Do you know God? Do you know God, and are you honoring him with your life? And it's from that basis that we can experience true joy and true fulfillment and contentment in the Lord. But we have to start from that basis. Do you really know God, and are you honoring him with your life? Because this topic, I believe, cuts to the core of what that means. It cuts to the core of whether or not we are truly glorifying and honoring God or dishonoring Him. Romans chapter 1, it characterizes all unbelievers. It characterizes a rebellious people who hate God, who oppose God, and it lists all of these character traits and these sins that they engage in. And among that, Paul says this, he says, All they, although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks. Although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks. So giving thanks is connected to honor. It's connected to knowing God. Uh, the, these rebellious people, they, they knew God in the sense that the universe and nature uh, testifies to his existence. It, test, it testifies to, uh, you know, that, that there is a God and that he's active and the moral law that we're all consciously aware of also testifies that. So that's what Paul means when he says, although they knew him, they didn't know him in a personal way that believers ought to know him. They didn't know God in that salvific way that believers ought to know God. Knowing him in that way entails, since unbelievers are characterized by ingratitude, knowing God in that way, in in that personal way, would therefore entail that believers are characterized by gratitude. I, I prayed about this topic. I felt burdened to bring this up because I gotta be honest. I'm concerned for Christians in America. I'm concerned for the church in America. I'm concerned that many people who call themselves Christians, who call themselves believers, don't really know what that means. They say they're believers, but they don't really know what that means. How many of you know that being a Christian, being a follower of Christ, which is what that word means, how many of you know that that is more than just making a one-time decision, right? Just because you might have recited a prayer once in your life when you were in youth group or wherever, it doesn't mean you're really a Christian. How do I know that? 
because people make decisions all the time and they're meaningless. People make one-time decisions all the time and they mean nothing. Just this past Rosh Hashanah, I made a New Year's resolution to, to wake up extra early every day and I would no longer press that snooze button. Once my alarm went off, that, that was it. I was going to force myself out of bed. I was going to make the most out of my day. I was going to get a lot more done, be a lot more productive. And I thought I was serious when I made that decision. I thought I was sincere when I made that decision. I even made a YouTube video about it I, around Rosh Hashanah. I said, yes, you know, we, like, I, I'm going to do this. This is a great time to make New Year's resolutions. We ought to do this, and this is something that I'm doing. And I guess I didn't really mean it. I guess I didn't really mean, mean it when I made that decision because I haven't followed through with it. There have been more mornings than, than not where I have pressed the snooze button once or twice or six times. <laughs> our actions prove whether or not our decision was genuine. Our life and our actions prove whether or not our decision was genuine. Uh, a lot of people, they go so far as to make vows. Do you know that? They go so far as to stand in front of God and everyone they love and make vows to a person standing across from them, I will love you for better or for worse. But when the for worse happens, many of those people prove that they never really meant it. When the for worse happens, many of those people prove that they never really meant for better or for worse. Because marriage is a daily commitment, right? You don't just say, I do once, and then you're good. You say, I do every day. You choose to love every day, especially on the difficult days. You choose, I do. You choose to surrender. You choose to lay down your life. You choose to put your spouse before yourself, their needs before your own. In the same way, in Luke 9, 23, what did Yeshua say? What did Yeshua, how did he define following him? How did he define being a follower of him? Which is what the word Christian means, right? Christian, follower of Christ. He said, if you would come after me, you must deny yourself, you must pick up your cross, not once, you must pick up your cross daily. Pick up your cross daily and follow me. That's what it means to be a believer. That's what it means to be a Christian. Our faith is made evident in how we live our lives. Are we loving enough? Are we loving until it hurts? Are we surrendering our lives? Are we serving our community? Are we serving our families? Are we pursuing holiness? Or is our religion worthless? What does James say? He says, if you claim to be religious but you do not bridle your tongue, your religion is worthless. Do you have self-control? Are the fruits of the Spirit made manifest in your life? Do you have patience and love and joy and peace? Or is your religion worthless? Do you not have control over your tongue? Do you gossip? Do you slander? Do you complain and grumble? Pure and undefiled religion, according to God, is this, to visit the widow and the orphan in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained from the world. Faith without works is dead, right? A lot of people think that being a believer is just adding Yeshua to their lifestyle. Just going about, doing whatever they want. Oh yeah, but I'm a Christian because I prayed a prayer once, and I thought I meant it. I was emotional at the time. Look at what it says in 1 John 2, starting in verse 3. And by this we know that we have come to know him, if we keep his commandments. Whoever says, I know him, but does not keep his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. Whoever says, I know him, but does not keep his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. If you claim to be a believer, but that truth is not evident 
in how you live your life. You are a liar. Don't blame me. I'm not the one saying it. John did. You're a liar. And I'm belaboring this point because this is important, guys. We need to check our hearts. We need to look at our lives. We need to make sure that we are that we truly care about God, that we truly care about following him. What does Paul say in 2 Corinthians 13.5? He says, examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. Examine yourselves. We need to do some introspection. We need to do some self-examination. Are you walking in God's will or not? Are you actively living out your faith or not? Speaking of God's will, have you ever wondered what God's will for your life is? You know, I I hear a lot of people talk about, man, I just want to know what God's will is for my life so that I can go, does does he want me to go to, go on a mission trip? What does he want for me? What am I supposed to do? Well, Paul has an answer to that question. Paul defines what God's will is right here in 1 Thessalonians 5, starting in verse 16. He says, rejoice always, pray without ceasing, Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. We don't have to wonder. That's that's what it says. Rejoice, pray, give thanks. Being thankful is the will of God for your life. It's a moral duty as God's children to be grateful. It's a moral duty as God's children to be grateful. But why? Why does God care so much about this? Why is gratitude so important? Why does it matter whether or not we're thankful? There are a number of reasons. First, like I mentioned earlier, um, our gratitude honors God. Like I said, Romans 1, our gratitude honors God, and that's our purpose in this life. Our purpose is not to strive to be healthy, wealthy, and prosperous, or famous. Our purpose is to glorify the Lord, and gratitude does that. In Psalm 50, starting in verse 22, it says, Mark this, then, you who forget God, lest I tear you apart, and there be none to deliver. The one who offers thanksgiving as his sacrifice glorifies me. To one who orders his way rightly, I will show the salvation of God. As you can see, God takes our our thankfulness, our gratitude very seriously. When we give thanks, we honor him. And the opposite is also true. When we do not give thanks, when we are ungrateful, we dishonor him. Ingratitude is, is the characteristic of unbelievers, rebellious people, according to Romans 1. We see this all the, a lot, by the way, after God delivered the Israelites from slavery, don't we? You'd think that after God had delivered them from slavery, that they'd be grateful that they were saved from slavery. Yay, we're not slaves anymore! Awesome! But over and over and over again, what do we see? We see that they constantly complain and grumble and complain and grumble They complain about their slavery in Egypt, which is understandable, but then God delivers them from Egypt, and then every minor inconvenience they face after that, they complain and want to go back to Egypt. It's amazing. They complain about being hungry, so God gives them manna from heaven. Here, you're hungry. Manna from heaven. Isn't this awesome? Be grateful. Give me thanks. Rejoice. Pray. And then they complain about the manna. Ah, we're sick of this detestable bread. Why doesn't God give us something better? They're thirsty, they're hungry, they don't like Moses. And so they complain and they grumble. And they're ungrateful. And it's easy to look back at the Israelites and judge them, right? But we do the same thing, don't we? How often do we do the same thing? Just like them, we we complain about the very things we used to hope and pray for. God, I need a job. God, please let someone hire me. So God gives you a job. 
I don't like the people I work with. I, I don't like that they're, they're making me work overtime. Can you believe that? That's ridiculous. Or, or my personal favorite, man, this job is just unfulfilling, which is one that I've said, admittedly. I just don't feel fulfilled in this, in this work. Or how about, God, please bring me a spouse. You know, I don't, it's not good for man to be alone. Please bless me with that, God. Please bring me that blessing. So God brings you your spouse. Ah, oh, they don't do enough around the house. This is ridiculous. They don't do this or that right. They don't love me enough in this way. I don't feel loved enough by them. Something's wrong with them. Send me someone else. We criticize and we complain and grumble about everything. Our job, our spouse, our friends, our church, everything, all the time, 24 hours a day, we're always complaining. By the way, you know why you're ungrateful? Because you have a sense of entitlement. You think that God owes you like he's some kind of genie that you've summoned from a magic lamp and he's just here to serve you and grant you wishes and to make sure you're happy and comfortable in this life. You complain because you somehow think that you deserve more or better than what you have. We've forgotten that what we do deserve is to go to hell. Think about that. We deserve condemnation. That's what the Bible says, all have sinned, all have fallen short of the glory of God. But it's by the grace of God that he doesn't give us what we deserve. We can be thankful for that. Romans 5, starting in verse 8, it says, God shows his love for us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. We, we have been saved from God's just wrath and condemnation through the blood of Messiah. A lot of people don't like that idea. They don't like to talk. It makes them uncomfortable. This idea that, that God would execute his wrath his justice on, on sinners and, and that there's su such a thing like what Yeshua talks about as eternal punishment. And I agree with them, by the way. I, I don't like that either. I, I, the thought of people being condemned and cast into outer darkness or, or whatever the nature of this eternal punishment, whatever that is, and there's all kinds of theological debates about it, but whatever that is, it's, it's not gonna be nice, right? <laughs> It's not going to be enjoyable. And I don't like it. I don't like that. It's a tough pill to swallow. However, I don't judge God. I don't judge God for that. He has the right and the authority to do what he wants. He's sovereign over the universe. And we deserve to be punished. We've sinned. We deserve it. But I still struggle with it. I still struggle with it emotionally. But I have to admit, uh, what makes even less sense to me than that is that God would send his son to die for a bunch of sinners like us. That while we were still sinners, while we were still rebellious, that he would die for us. Rather than condemning us like we deserve, he has mercy on us. Why? Because he loves us. Think about that. God loves us. He loved you in your rebellion. He loved you before you did anything for him, before you even acknowledged him. He loved you in the, the depths of your depravity and your sinfulness when you've hurt people. He said, I still love that person. I still want to save them. I still want to redeem them. I still want a relationship with them. I want to give them a hope and a future. The very people that have spit in his face and rebelled against him. As a father, I cannot even fathom my little girl dying for anybody. I can't. It doesn't register. I, 
I have no box in my brain to even contain that thought. I would never let my little girl die for anyone, much less people who hate me. And yet God so loved the world that he gave us what we don't deserve. Ephesians 2 verse 8 says, by, this is a verse we all know, by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your doing, it is the gift of God. By grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your doing, it is a what? It is the gift of God. We don't deserve anything good that we have. Every good and perfect gift comes from the Father of lights, right? As it says in James 1, 17, I think. Every good and perfect gift comes from the Father of lights. It's a gift. Your entire life is a gift. Your salvation is a gift. What do you say when someone gives you a gift? Thank you, right? God has given us the greatest gift in his son, Yeshua the Messiah. God has given us new life, He's given us purpose and identity. We're part of something bigger. We're part of a a movement to establish his kingdom on earth. We We have a purpose. In Acts chapter two, um, this was during the day of Shavuot when, when the Holy Spirit was poured out on the disciples. Peter was giving a sermon on that day and he taught about Yeshua, the Messiah, and he was giving the gospel message. This is what it says in Acts 2, starting in verse 36. He says, let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, brothers, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So we get another gift. But what I wanna point out here is that when these people heard the gospel, when they heard about this Yeshua, who became Lord and Messiah, the same Yeshua that was crucified for them, that they crucified the way that Yeshua put it. It says that they were cut to the heart, that they were impacted emotionally, that it hit them in their guts, which by the way is the correct response to the gospel. It's the correct response to God's love He loves us so much that he would send his son to die for us so that we can be saved and redeemed. When they asked what they needed to do after they were cut to the heart, after they were moved by this, Peter says to what? He says, repent and be baptized. In other words, commit your life to the Messiah. You're a new creation now. Don't go back to your old ways. You have a new life now. You are dedicated to the Lord now. Walk in that Holy Spirit that you've been given. Say no to sin. So gratitude. Gratitude. When it comes to gratitude, I think that we need to start from this premise. That we've been given a gift that we don't deserve We've been given this great gift, and how can we not be grateful? How can we not be grateful? A second reason why gratitude is important is that it causes us to appreciate what we have rather than longing for what we don't have. It causes us to appreciate what we have rather than longing for what we don't have. There's nothing necessarily wrong with looking to the next bigger thing, you know, looking for better circumstances, wanting to get a bigger house to fit your family or a a new car. There's nothing wrong with any of that stuff. 
necessarily. But by definition, you can't be grateful for something you don't have. By definition, you can't be grateful for something you don't have. And if all you ever do is wish for what you don't have, you'll never be grateful. And, by the way, you'll never truly be at peace. You'll never truly be content. You'll never truly have that life that that Yeshua desires for us. Because it has to start from that basis of, of gratitude. Ecclesiastes 5 Verse 10, Solomon affirms this. He says, He who loves money will not be satisfied with money, nor he who loves wealth with his income. This also is vanity. If your love is for money, you're not going to be satisfied with money. More money, a better job, a bigger house, a better situation. If those things are your sole focus and obsession, you're not going to be satisfied even when you get those things because there's always going to be something you don't have. There's always going to be more. Ravi Zacharias once said, he's a, he's a Christian philosopher, he once said that the loneliest moment in life is when you have just experienced what you thought would deliver the ultimate and it has just let you down. The loneliest moment in life is when you have just experienced what you thought would deliver the ultimate and it has just let you down. Ingratitude in life occurs when we do everything we can to satisfy our soul's desire with anything but God. Ingratitude in life occurs when we do everything we can to satisfy our soul's desire with anything and everything but God. Solomon experienced this. Read the book of Ecclesiastes. He said, I I wanted to test my heart with pleasure, right? And he said, I had all of these great things. I had all of this wealth. I had the big amazing mansion. I had all of the the wealth and all of the, the singers and all of the servants, everything I could possibly imagine. And in the end, it was all vanity. It was all a chasing after the wind. His sole focus was on the stuff. His sole focus and obsession is what was on what he didn't have. And then, once he got everything he had, he realized it's still not enough. It's still not enough. Just like Solomon, we we delude ourselves into thinking that whatever we, we lack will bring us contentment. Once we get that one thing, I'll finally be content. I'll finally be fulfilled. The message of Ecclesiastes, you need to go back and read it. It's, you, need to, you need to be grateful for the good things you have. Enjoy them, they're gifts. There's nothing wrong with good things in life. They're gifts. Solomon says, whatever you, your hand finds to do, do it with your might. But ultimately, our purpose and our fulfillment is found only on God, and it's only from that basis that those things can even be enjoyed, truly. It's only from that basis of our focus being on God that anything else can even truly be enjoyed. 1 Timothy 6, 6 6-8 says, But godliness with contentment is great gain, for we brought nothing into the world and we cannot take anything out of the world. But if we have food and clothing, with these we will be content. So, Gratitude helps us to focus and to appreciate the things we have rather than longing and obsessing over the things that we don't have. A third reason why gratitude is important is that it helps us grow in faith and steadfastness. What does James say? James chapter one, he says, to count it all joy when you face trials and tribulations of many kind for the testing of your faith produces steadfastness and let steadfastness have its full effect that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Even in times of profound pain, even in times of profound loss, we can still be grateful. And that gratitude will give us the strength to endure those trials. That steadfastness will give us the strength that we would would become perfect and complete. How many of you guys have been following um, the fires that that are going on in California right now, right? 
it's devastating, these fires that are, that are going on. I've, I've been following it pretty closely and been following it on Twitter. I've been reading a lot of tweets from people that have been affected by this, even celebrities that have been, their, their whole house has been destroyed in these fires. And it's, you know, there's a lot of reasons to be depressed <laughs> and, and unhappy about that happening. But I got to say that I was encouraged as I read this because most of these tweets, even from these celebrities that have been coming in, were like, yeah, I'm sad that I lost my house. It's a bummer, but my family's okay. My spouse is okay. My children, my pets are okay. Everything with a heartbeat is okay, so I'm okay. As believers, we know that that even in times of immense grief, even in times of immense pain and suffering, we still have the greatest gift. If we're believers, we still have that greatest gift of Messiah. Therefore, choosing gratitude in, in times of pain and loss is important. It helps us to be humble it helps us to trust in God's goodness, to, to really believe and have that faith in God's goodness even in the midst of pain. We've all experienced pain, but that does not take away from God's goodness, and we can still rejoice and pray and give thanks in those times. A fourth reason why gratitude is important is that it makes the world better and ingratitude makes the world worse. Gratitude is important because it makes the world better, and ingratitude makes the world worse. When we're feeling grateful, what do we do? When we're grateful, we're automatically more inclined to be nicer to people. It's just, it's just the way it is. We feel humbled, we feel joyful, we feel generous, and therefore we wanna be kind. When the times in your life when you felt most grateful, right, they were usually related to you being more kind at the same time. Yet when we're feeling ungrateful, we're automatically more inclined to be mean to people or to be frustrated with people or to be impatient with people. So ingratitude fosters discontentment, which leads to anger, which could even lead to hurting others whether that be through simple unkindness, the, your impatience towards the waitress at Applebee's who got your order wrong and you lash out at her, or it could possibly lead to worse. It could possibly lead to violence. There was a racist white supremacist that shot up a synagogue in Pittsburgh just a few weeks ago because he felt that white people were being victimized. White people were being hurt because of whatever it was, you know, the, the, the Jewish people, whatever his conspiracy theory was, that the Jewish people were controlling this and, and you know, causing all of the suppression of white people. So he felt victimized and that gave him his justification for carrying out a violent evil act. A sense of victimhood is, is often connected, I believe, to ingratitude. Now that I've probably driven this point into the ground, <laughs> what are some ways that we, we can cultivate gratitude? We talked about why gratitude is important, why it's necessary, why it's a moral mandate for us as believers. Now let's talk about what we can actually do to be more thankful, right? As I already mentioned, gratitude is a moral duty, and that entails that we have a choice in the matter. Gratitude is not just fe a feeling that we have or don't have. Gratitude is a choice, an action, and it's not always an easy choice. In fact, the easy choice is to be ungrateful. You have to actually work. You have to actually take the step and make the decision to be grateful. So here's some ideas that I, I think can perhaps help to cultivate a thankful heart that we ought to have as believers. 
The first reason, or the, the first way, the first key, let's call it, keys to gratefulness, keys to gratitude. It can be a book, I don't know. The first key is to be aware of your inclination to be ungrateful. Be aware of your inclination to be ungrateful. So as believers, what are we given? We're given several gifts, right? We're given the, the gift of eternal life through the Messiah. We're also given the gift of the Holy Spirit. We ought to ask the Holy Spirit to, to help us, to, to help us to notice when we're complaining to help us notice when we're maybe fantasizing a little bit too much about things that we want that we don't have, fostering that ingratitude. One practical thing uh, that you can do is to ask someone to hold you accountable, your spouse or a friend, ask them to hold you accountable, that when they notice that you're being ungrateful, that they have the right to speak into your life and to encourage you. Just don't start complaining about them. <laughs> But seriously, you can, f you can find someone to, uh, to hold you accountable and that would help. A second key to gratitude, I kind of like that, is to count your blessings. Count your blessings. Lots of families, uh, they have a Thanksgiving tradition and I think it's a good tradition of going around the table and reciting what they're thankful for. Just going around the table and, and, you know, telling each other out loud what they're thankful for for the year. And I recommend doing this more than once a year. We can do this every week. We can, we, it can be a new Arab Shabbat tradition. Every week, if we, if we want to get super practical, we can make a list of blessings. Every week, make a list of blessings, things in your life that you're grateful for, and then every week pray and, and praise God and rejoice that he's given you those things and thank him for those things. If life is, is difficult for you right now, and I, I would encourage you to think about even the little things that you have to be grateful because those little things add up. When you, when you really, when you try to do this, when you take that step, when you make that decision, to be grateful, and you think about the little things, the little gifts that you're given in life, they add up, and they'll change your perspective. Challenge yourself to think about even the small little joys and blessings in life, like the fact that you're breathing, or how about the fact that food tastes so good? God didn't have to give us taste buds, right? Food could taste like, I don't know, rocks. All food could taste like rocks. <laughs> But he didn't create us like that. He created us with taste buds. He created us with the ability to experience that and to, to have joy in that and for dopamine to be released in our brains and to literally reward us. Our brains literally reward us for enjoying things. Isn't that awesome? And we can be thankful for that. One thing uh, during the worship service, um, we have a, a two-year-old little girl and, and she is a handful. Man, I, I love her so much, but she is just wild and crazy, always running around, always doing things, and, and it, it doesn't, uh, she doesn't like to sit still a lot of the time. Well, today during worship, um, all she wanted to do was to have me hold her. You know, for a good portion of the worship service, she just wanted to have me hold her, and she had her arms wrapped around me in a big hug, and I was just holding her as I was singing, and I was actually thinking, I'm like, God, thank you for hugs. Thank you for hugs. Th thank you that you've given us as humans this ability to connect with each other in this way, with, with a hug, that you've given us this amazing bond between father and, and daughter, that, that we get to experience this, that it feels good, that we can enjoy this moment, that we don't just telepathically transfer, you know, good feelings to each other, <laughs> that we, we can actually wrap our arms around each other and, and embrace each other. That's awesome. That's a gift from God. It, it's, a, it's a blessing. If you're going through a hard time right now, if life is hard, ask someone for a hug. <laughs> and thank God for that hug.
A third key to gratitude is to speak blessings. Speak blessings. Judaism actually has uh, this really awesome tradition. Um, I do a lot of these, these blessings, but they basically have blessings for everything, literally everything. They even have a blessing upon hearing bad news. But they have blessings before you eat, they have blessings uh, before you read the Torah, they have blessings when you put on seat seat, everything. And it's just a really great way to, re, you know, to remind yourself, to get into the habit of blessing God, get into the habit of, of thanking him every day for everything. Every time before we eat, we ought to bless God. Every time before we open the word, before we go to church, I, I, think, um, I think that would be key to training ourselves to, to think gratitude, to think from that perspective that everything we have is a gift. A fourth key would be to remember. Remember the gospel, remember God's love for you, that he gave his son for you, remember what he's done in your life, remember the, the people in your life that, that mean so much to you. Think about, think about those things. Maybe uh, one thing you can do, a practical thing, is to start keeping a journal. Start writing down everything in your life that, that you're thankful for. People in your life that have blessed you. Fifth key would be generosity. Generosity. One way that we express our gratitude for what we have is to give to someone else, to help those who are less fortunate, who don't have as much as we have. To, it, it could be as simple as buying someone's lunch, to give back, to give to charity. My dad actually came and visit a, visited us last week and it was, it was an awesome visit. He lives in uh, Illinois. So he drove up to see us. And my dad, he, he has a really well-paying job. He's pretty wealthy uh, and blessed in that way. And the entire time he was there, he basically just bought us things. Like he took us out to lunch and he, he took us, he literally took us to the grocery store. He's like, all right, it's on me. Go to the grocery store, get all the groceries that you need for the week and I'm gonna pay for it. And my wife was like saying, man, I kind of feel bad that he's doing all of this for us all the time, that he's, that he's paying for all of this stuff. And I'm like, no, you don't understand. He likes it. He, this feels good to him. You know, he loves to give. And it's true, isn't it? It feels good to give. So one way that we can foster that gratitude is to, is to give back. A sixth key is to see trials from God's perspective. See trials from God's perspective. There's a reason the Bible says to, that we are to count it all joy when you face trials because we can look back at our lowest points in times of immense pain, immense grief, immense suffering. We can look back at those times that we've gone through and we can see how we've grown from those times, what we've learned from those times. And we can actually be grateful. Wow, God, thank you for allowing me to go through that. Thank you for making me perfect and complete through that experience that I'm now, I, ha I now have more wisdom. I now love people better. I like who I am more now that I've had to go through that. Worship team, uh, you can come back up. There's a, there's a lot more that we can talk about when it comes to this topic, but I hope that I made it clear that, grat I, I hope I made it clear just how gratitude, how important gratitude is, there I go. <laughs> I hope that you're inspired to, to take this seriously. With Thanksgiving next week, now's, now's the perfect time to cultivate this heart of gratitude, to really reflect on this, to really examine ourselves, as Paul says, to see if we are characterized by gratitude as believers ought to be. I'll end with this quote here from Charles Spurgeon. 
one of my favorite Christian pastors and ministers in the past. Charles Spurgeon says, here is a standing reason for thanksgiving. Although we may not always be healthy, nor always prosperous, yet God is always good, and therefore, there is always a sufficient argument for giving thanks unto Jehovah. That he is a good God essentially, that he cannot be otherwise than good, should be a fountain out of which the richest praises should perpetually flow. No matter what we're going through, God is still good. We can still trust in his goodness. We can still be grateful for the greatest gift that he's given us in his son. Will you guys pray with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you. <laughs> we just thank you. We thank you. You are worthy of our thanks. You are worthy of our gratitude. Where do, we're sorry for our ingratitude. We know that we don't have the right to be ungrateful. We don't have the right because of all you've given us. God, we want to be grateful. We want to honor you. More than anything, God, we want you to be glorified. Will you help us, God? Through your Holy Spirit, Lord, will you empower us to overcome our natural inclination to the negative, the natural inclination to criticize, to complain, to grumble? Help us, God, to, to recognize that. Help us to be on guard against that. And help us go beyond just being on guard against ingratitude, but to actively choose gratitude. To give thanks. You are worthy, God, of our gratitude. We love you. We praise you. In Yeshua's name, amen. Shalom. I'm Matthew Vandrells, and I hope you enjoyed this message. Founded in Truth exists to cultivate a fellowship of image bearers that live the redeemed life only Yeshua can give. If this ministry has been a blessing to you, we would love to hear from you. Send us an email through the contact form on our website and tell us how God has used this ministry to edify your faith and relationship with Him. If you'd like to see more messages like this one, subscribe to our YouTube channel by clicking here. If you'd like to donate to this ministry and be a part of what God is doing through it, you can donate through our online giving portal here. We thank you for your continued support, and we look forward to next time. Shalom.